Welcome back to Tiny TV. Right now, I'm sitting at the Royal Danish Library, the building called the Black Diamond. And right now, the Royal Danish Library hosts a Nick Cave exhibition called Stranger Than Kindness. You were born and you build yourself piece by piece. You construct a narrative, and you become an individual. It features eight rooms that tells the story about Nick Cave, the artist, the poet, the man, the myth, the soul of one of the best musicians I have ever known. I'm sitting right now at his desks, writing on his typewriter, in his office chair. And these things are not props. It is actually Nick Cave's real stuff. It's his books, it's his notebooks, it's all of the things that he has gathered throughout an entire career. Back in December 2020, Nick Cave visited this exhibition and gave a press conference to a lot of the best Danish newspapers, TV stations and radios and media outlets. I was there with Tiny TV and the Danish Broadcasting Corporation and got to ask Nick Cave a few questions. The press conference was more or less one and a half hour long and by the end of the week I will upload the entire press conference for you to watch. But today I have edited a small video of all the questions that I asked Nick Cave when he was here in Copenhagen. So I really hope you enjoy it. If you like the content that you see here on Tiny TV, please consider subscribing, give it a like or share it on your social media platform. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Anas from the Danish National Radio, the radio channel P6 Beat. In 2013, we made a six hour long Nick Cave special covering everything from the boys next door and up until Pushed the Sky Away. And back then, we described you with all the usual music cliches the dark introvert lord of poetry and song. And since then, a lot of things has happened. You opened the Red Hand Files in 2018. Uh, you've made concerts where you are a moderator and audience can ask you questions. And now we're here in Copenhagen for this grand exhibition. Why have you suddenly been so eager to open up Pandora's box and show your life in the way you've been doing the past five years? Well, first of all, I'm still dark. I've just opened that up a little bit. I have a tendency to, to darkness uh, that, I, that I try and do something about, but it doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, so that, that kind of... Um, you know, once again, it's... Um, well, very, various things happened. Various things have happened to me. Once, uh, in, in all due respect to everyone in this room, uh, I, I, I did an interview after my son died, and, and I just couldn't. Uh, I, it, it was with a friend, actually, and it was a good interview, and, but, it, but it just felt in some way diminishing. You know, uh, he wrote it very beautifully and sensitively, but there was something about the experience that felt diminishing in some kind of way. Uh, and, um, and so I just stopped doing interviews. It was an incredible thing. I can't, ex can't tell you how liberating it was to suddenly not have to talk to the press. Um, as much as I love you all, each one of you, um, there was something um, where I could take control of, of what was written about me and what was said about me. Uh, and, and I did that through the Red Hand Files. So that was talking directly and answering directly fans' questions. Um, and these in-conversation events. And this was just a further cementing of a kind of connection uh, the, uh, with my audience that became 
um, it ceased to be about, it became, it became very, very important to me, the Red Hand Files, um, as a way to feel connected um, and not just float away. Um, and they're, they're, you know, I get like maybe 100 a day, questions a day, or 70 or 80 or something like that. And I read them every day. It's a huge undertaking, the Red Hand Files. And, and to write this one letter, even though it's a small piece of writing, takes a lot of thought and effort. But it, it's, it's this extraordinary portal that I have into the minds uh, of my uh, fans, let's say. And um, it's amazing to see what goes on. Through, through the pandemic, these letters have become really uh, incredibly moving, um, but very frightening too, uh, about the effects of lockdown on, you know, on people, and, and on not just the, the, their jobs and stuff, but on their mental health and so forth. This all gets reflected back at me through the, through the red hand files and through the, the questions that get answered, and it, it's just... Um, an extraordinarily moving thing to be a part of the Red Hand Files. Do you want to ask something else? Just to, uh, to follow up on that, it seems to move you personally that the Red Hand Files has given you, your audience a voice. Do you think that this connection with your audience over time will float into your artistic side, to your records or your literature? Yeah, I mean, I don't see how it can't. You know, it's... Um, I don't know, I, I thought it might have an adverse effect. I thought it might be, I didn't know what sort of effect it has because it's, um, it's not addictive, but it's, you know, it's not beyond the feeling that perhaps people get when they do Twitter or whatever, except that it's deeply it, it, except that it's not just fucking crazy, right? It's deeply moving. And there's something about that connection that's, that's really, really changed my life. Um, but I'm writing a lot, you know. Over, through lockdown, I started writing a lot. Uh, write, I mean, writing a lot of lyrics. So that's going really well. Yeah, no, I'm really happy about that too. <laughs> um, because, and, it's, and, and the lyrics, uh, I think, are able to find their way beyond the, the current situation, which is pretty fucking hard, I've got to say, to write outside of this current situation because this situation is taking up so much oxygen. It's so huge. Um, the political situation, COVID, the, the whole thing, it's, it's, it's massive. It's taking up so much kind of mental bandwidth um, that you, wa you wonder what, how, you, how you can write about things beyond the moment. But it's, I, I, it seems to be working really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to talk a bit about Ghost Teen and also how it's represented in the exhibition because I find it very interesting that there is this element of chaos in the exhibition with all these things shattered everywhere, but Ghost Teen has a calmness which is just so beautiful. And, and if I have a religion, it, it's music, and my New Testament is definitely Ghost Teen, your best album for years. What's, um, what's your Old Testament? That Birth, would, birthday party stuff? No, Henry's Dream, I think. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a favourite. Um, bear, bear that in mind. <laughs> but on Ghost Teen, I hear new things from you vocally, a new way of singing in some of the, th of the songs. And I also see it in the exhibition. That's the calmness coming in there. And it, it's almost like a new Nick Cave voice. Going into the recording sessions of Ghost Teen, did you have a blueprint for how you wanted to sing these songs, or did it come along as you worked with it with Warren? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was l largely improvised. Ghostine. I mean, all of our records, the last three records, are mostly improvised. By that I mean, 
um, that lyrics have been abandoned. I'm not sitting there with a piece of paper and singing lyrics. I'm just singing stuff, right? Um, and a lot, of it's, a lot of it's rubbish and a lot of it's really beautiful, but we cut out uh, pieces that are beautiful and, uh, and we kind of edit stuff together. So something like the spinning song is like three pieces of music edited together and it's incredibly... Uh, I, I mean, I find Ghostine a really moving record too because it's very mysterious to me how it all came about, mostly because of the Im improvised nature. But songs are literally... There's a little bit of me singing a song about Elvis and we chop that into And I Love You that gets repeated over and over, which is just some other bit from somewhere else. And then we chop on Peace Will Come and it just becomes this beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and, and I'm incredibly uh, proud of the fact that we can make songs that don't sound like improvised songs in an improvised way. Um, so it's a huge, huge uh, leap forward, Ghostine, for, for us. And the singing style um, was, I don't know how that happened, I just started to sing high, right, in, in a falsetto, and found that I could up there. You know, I mean, it was, it's a little ropey sometimes, but I, I basically have a voice that can exist up there in, in, in some kind of way, and that was just a... That was a, um, uh, you know, I, I had no idea that that even existed. So. <laughs>